Without any further ado, would you please join me in welcoming the director of the film, Rory Kennedy. And as uh, you may have imagined, uh, our special guest this evening is one of the subjects of the film, Stuart Harrington. I guess the only thing harder than watching that movie was to have lived that movie. Um, and uh, I wanted to begin, though, with uh, Rory and ask you to tell us uh, how this project began for you. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here again. And it's so wonderful to, to be here as part of the series, which I love. And it's great to be here with the audience. So thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I was approached by Mark Samuels at American Experience to make a film about the last days in Vietnam. And um, when he asked me, I was actually, my initial response was a sense that there had been so much done on Vietnam and I didn't know if I could add anything new. Um, but then as I did the research and, and realized actually how much I didn't know and in talking to people around me, how much they didn't know about these events that took place in those final days and how important these events were. I, I got drawn into it and then of course when I started uncovering these stories of the heroes who uh, really went against US policy and put their lives at stake to try to save the Vietnamese, um, I felt like that was a story that really had never been told and needed to be told and um, was, you know, would feel very honored to be able to have told, told this story. Um, I think if I got this correct, because I, I take these notes in my phone while we're watching the film, uh, you had said, Stuart, that uh, the ceasefire was in 73 in, uh, was it February? January. January of 73, and you didn't come into Saigon until August of 73? First week of August, 73, yes. And so what were you doing? What, what was your military career up until your coming to these events in, in Saigon? What were you doing? Well, I was a military intelligence officer, and I'd served two years in Vietnam during the war and made all those friends in the Vietnamese intelligence community. Um, I was back in the States for one year of intelligence training in Arizona when the ceasefire was signed, and I was told that I was on orders to go back, even though the treaty only allowed for 50 American military uh, I had the Vietnamese language, I was a captain, and there was a job in Saigon for me in the U.S. mission. So I went back in August of 73 for what was to be a two-year tour, but the North Vietnamese weren't party to that deal, and they preempted things, causing us to, what you, causing what you just saw to happen. So I was there. Uh, I just in the wrong place at the wrong time, if you will. Uh, I was very dedicated to the cause of the Vietnamese. I was conscious, perhaps because I spoke the language and had a lot of Vietnamese friends, that these were people who were on the receiving end of our policy. So if a policy decision to sign a ceasefire takes place, that begets human events, and those human events become headlines, and those of us who are out there doing what the policy, implementing the policy that we're sent to implement, uh, we live those events, and, and that's really the story of what happened during the ceasefire with me. The, um, uh, I mean, you, you there, there's a couple of points I want to touch on, then we, we're going to get to questions relatively soon, but, um, it, obviously, it's it's this is the seminal event in in my life. This is the thing the war in Vietnam is the thing that affects every other thing that happens in our country pretty much, and so much of what happens, in my opinion, is a response to that. But you see where uh, 
um, no matter what your feelings are about the war, for or opposed at the time, you see where Ford says, you know, I want the 722 million and I want to leave these people hanging out to dry. And the, the Congress says, no way. And the, uh, there's obviously a lot of things going on in the country at that time, you know, Ellsberg and a lot of the political Nixon resigns. And, and was that your sense of it at the time? Because you can talk about it at the time it happened, or you can talk about it, you know, in retrospect, that once Nixon was gone, did, did, you, did all of you in military intelligence believe that once Nixon was gone, it was over? It was very clear to me and to those who followed the situation carefully that the commitments that President Nixon had made in good faith under the Paris Agreement, such as you saw in the film, the letter promising the U.S. would respond with full force uh, in, in the event of a ceasefire violation by the North Vietnamese, it was very clear to us that when President Nixon had to give up his office that uh, there was nobody, nobody who would follow him who could re-intervene in Vietnam. And of course, that was the lesson that the North Vietnamese took from it as well. So if you were on the inside in Saigon, in where I was in the intelligence business, uh, it was very clear what was going to happen by the end of 1974. Um, for that reason, I began mailing my possessions back to the States, one little box at a time so as not to alarm my Vietnamese co-workers. Uh, I wrote home that, you know, August is not looking good. I'll be home sooner than that. Um, and did, all you have of a us, did you have a family at the time? Uh, I was a bachelor at the time. But How uh, old were you then in 73, 74? Uh, I'm a Pearl Harbor baby, so you can figure about 34, 35. Um, I was a bachelor, but I had a, um, I had a situation like so many Americans in Saigon. No sense in... <laughs> hiding from it, uh, in the form of a young woman. Uh, there were three children. Uh, every one of us were faced... Is that what military intelligence officers call that, a situation? Yeah, that was a situation, yeah. <laughs> so, okay. so I just want to get that straight. My, ba <laughs> my bachelorhood ended. Uh, I smuggled uh, on an Air Force plane to Thailand, that family out of Vietnam, um, eventually back to the States. Um, not believing that it was even thinkable to leave them behind, although that's what happened in so many hundreds of thousands of cases, regrettably. But I had the opportunity, because I was there, um, to do the right thing. And that's not to paint myself as some great, you know, setter of the moral pace or anything, but I was there and I could do it. Whereas others who had situations like that were calling us on the phone begging us, you know, my wife's name is Lynn Hong, she lives on uh, Hong Top Tui Street, please, somebody, anybody, go get her. There are four children, my commander won't let me leave the Philippines to come back. And we spent a lot of time fielding requests like that. So everyone had a situation. Um, the only difference between those who were able to do something about it and those who weren't was just being in the right or the wrong place. Now, um, another thing that comes to mind is that y you defy you and a whole cabal of other people here, if you want to put it that way, or of brave men and women, you defy this order. They told you you really shouldn't. You, you want to talk about that for a moment, that you... Well, it was correct in the film that the deputy defense attache, who was an Air Force One star, uh, was, in fact, fired by Ambassador Martin because he got on the wrong side of the ambassador over the issue of evac evacuation. There's no question about that. Um, those of us who did what we did, and I think you can see from the film that it was a pretty large club of folks. There were State Department people, Army people, uh, various people who rose to the occasion and did what they did. Um, we didn't really consciously think on a day-to-day -day basis that we were laying it on the line and that we could be fired, even though I allude to that in the film. But that's really at the time it was more, you got to do what's right. There are all these people who are in need. If and when we leave, and it was really a case of when we leave, uh, you're letting them all hang out to dry. And it's just unconscionable for us because our policy didn't work because of reasons that are too numerous to go into here and we don't want to refight that. But it's just unthinkable when put in that situation uh, to myself and to a lot of others to do the dishonorable thing. And the dishonorable thing was to do nothing. So we did what we did, 
Uh, yes, if we would have been caught and our, and our feet held to the fire, it, the consequences were career ending. But we had a lot of support. For example, I had a lieutenant colonel and a colonel I worked for. And they were totally behind me. I never did anything behind their back. They knew that I got a truck, that I loaded people from the intelligence community up and smuggled them into Tonson Yut. Uh, then they cooperated with me and I cooperated with them and we got out our South Vietnamese counterparts from the missing in action delegation I worked with. We took out 1,100 of them, the families, not the officers and the men. We told the officers and the men, wouldn't you feel more comfortable if your families were in Guam, safe havened, and then like us, you stay because we're all soldiers and we stay to do our duty. And then eventually, depending on how things go, we can reunite you with your families. And they agreed with unanimity. And that's the pictures you saw of the buses with all those South Vietnamese officers saying goodbye to their families. Uh, the problem was that we made that commitment in good faith. And then when the rockets started and the end game happened so, so suddenly, we left them all behind. So if you remember some of you who are a little bit older, that there was one shipload of Vietnamese who came out in the evacuation who went back, you shouldn't think ill of the Vietnamese for electing to go back because we probably left their husbands behind and they, they went back because of that. Uh, so there were these moral fences that one had to climb each time and, and we did our very best, but it was sometimes not enough. Mm. Yeah. Rory, there's so many moving interviews in this film to watch as a viewer, and I'm wondering what it was like for you to both conduct these interviews and for these uh, people who were talking about events that happened around 40 years ago, um, the sense you got for what it was like for them to kind of re-explore re these, these times at this time in their life. Um, well, you know, we did probably, I think, uh, 25 or 30 interviews for the film. So there was, there was obviously a range of experiences that people had in, in making this, in looking back at these events. I think for the people who were on the front lines, um, it's, a, you know, you really felt like they were reliving it again. And I think for them it was like yesterday, um, Dam Pham, who was one of the Vietnamese who we interviewed, who you might recall from the film, who ended up in a prison camp for 13 years. You know, after I did an interview with him for a, a few hours where he really relived these events, and I talked to him a few days later, and he, he said that he was still recovering from the interview. Um, that it was so raw for him. And then when we, the film premiered at Sundance, when I asked him if he would be interested in coming there for the premiere, he said, you know, I really, I can't watch the film. It's just, it's too much for me. Um, so I think particularly for the Vietnamese who, um, who, you know, so much happened to them and it's, 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 uh, it's so raw for them, and I think that many of them still has, haven't come to terms with it, or you know, it's not a culture where they talk about things a lot. Um, to, to go through these events again was, um, was quite intense. Also with films like this, because we've seen this with a number of documentaries that we've screened at the, uh, the, the Summer Doc series, just for you to explain to the audience, I mean, it's obviously laden with stock footage and news footage. And that, if you'll explain, that costs a lot of dough, doesn't it? I mean, don't you have to license all this footage from somebody? Yeah, and, I, you know, the, I mean, I think that that's part of the power of this film is the archival, and it played such a huge role in helping people to really go back to these events and be able to visualize them. We went um, through the regular sources, ABC, NBC, CBS. We tried to go deeper so you didn't see the same footage that people have seen about Vietnam. But... What we were lucky with was when I was when I was developing this film, Ethel was coming out. So I had identified a number of people I wanted to interview for this film, and I kept inviting them to screenings of the Ethel that I was having up and down on the East Coast. And at one of those screenings in Washington, I was talking to a guy who had worked on um, the USS Kirk and told him about the film. And then he said to me, you know, I have a friend who I was talking to who, who was on the Kirk, and he said that he just came across a box full of undeveloped 8-millimeter tapes 
um, footage that was from the USS Kirk in 1975. Are you interested in that? <laughs> and I said, yes, I'm really interested in that. And so I got the guy's number. I called him at 9 o'clock the next morning and said, you know, I'd love to, to look at the footage and, you know, I'm happy to develop it. And anyway, he was very protective. He was in Washington. I, it, so he didn't want to fed, FedEx it out, so I sent him a ticket. And I flew him out to LA and we developed the film. And you know, all of the footage that you see of the helicopters going overboard, he took all of that. The Chinook story of the family that jumped out of the helicopter, he took all of that footage. The footage at the end, the Armitage story of all of the people on the on the ships, that was all him. And then the um, flag lowering ceremony. So all of that footage was him. We used 12 minutes of his footage in the film, you know, so that was a treasure trove and, and I think made a huge difference in the stories we could tell. Um, now, this is going to sound like a silly question, but this was just occurred to me in terms of, of, the, of the logistics for people like me who don't remember or, don't, or didn't learn, even if I did, I don't remember, the topography or the physical plant or whatever you want to call it of Saigon. So when you so that air air force base is called what the airport? Tanzanut. Tanzanut. And that's a US <laughs> close. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that base we'll call it. Um, uh, the uh, uh, so that's a US that, that that's a US military base, air force base. During the war, it was a U.S. military base, and it, Prior doubled, to that. it, it doubled as the uh, civilian base, terminal. Right. Civilian terminal. For so it was Saigon. both. Yeah, it, both. During the ceasefire, it wasn't a U.S. base; it was a. South so all the fuel airport. you need for all these helicopters is where? Well, the well, choppers, was that ever threatened when the North Vietnamese were rolling down the the coast? The um, the rocketing and the artillery against Tunsun Yut on the night of the 29th, early morning hours of the 29th hit the uh, fuel tanks of the Air America choppers, which are the silver ones, the, the UEs that were landing in and out of the embassy and bringing people. Air America was a CIA proprietary. Uh, but the fleet and, you know, the 75 Marine helicopters, and by the way, there were a dozen uh, Air Force heavy lift helicopters off the carrier Midway, I think. That fleet was, its, it's fueling came right off the, off the f carriers. So they didn't have a fuel issue at all. And when you look at the map, uh, your map, I think, that you created, where you see the red, the very, very uh, uh, bold red, blood red, moving down, it moves along the border with Laos and Cambodia before they start moving down the coast. As we've, uh, people have been taught, uh, in my recollection, uh, did they move more successfully? down along the borders of those countries, first in the interior of North and South Vietnam, because they were going into those countries as well and hopping over those borders as well? Well, for the duration of the war, they had violated Laotian and Cambodian neutrality, and that's not a shame on them on my part, because so did we. But um, they seized the Central Highlands and those areas that were contiguous to Laos and Cambodia in the March campaign when they first attacked. Uh, what was different about April and leading up to the 30 April thing was that they started coming straight down Highway 1 on the coast in broad daylight with SA-2 missiles, tanks, uh, fuel line, you know, fuel trucks, and they put 16 divisions very well equipped and supplied uh, with a lot of pre-positioned stuff that they had used the ceasefire to build up the stocks. And they were able to come down from basically the second week of March until the second week of April in four weeks all the way down the coastline to within to where they had Saigon encircled. So it was a dramatic, and when if you knew anything about the history of the war, the fact that the North Vietnamese Army, 16 divisions are coming down Highway 1 toward Saigon, that tells you something. It wasn't good. Um, we will take some questions, but I have one last question for uh, Rory. Do we have microphones out here, by the way? We're ready? Okay. Um, so your last film was about your mother, the last film we had with you here. Did you make something in the interim? Um, no, not really. I do, I'm doing a series uh, about women that I'm also working on, but basically that was my last big film. Uh, so which is more difficult for you to make? 
I have a feeling it's the one about your mother. <laughs> so <laughs> much more difficult. <laughs> so much more difficult. Yeah, it's However, mother. your family, obviously, your uncle the president of the United States, your father was attorney general. Uh, their careers uh, overlapped the earliest years of the Vietnam era. Was this a difficult film for you to make? I think that um, probably my f family's connection to Vietnam it informed my passion about the subject. And I think, you know, like you, I felt like it's a seminal event in our history and my life. And it was kind of in the ether of my childhood. And, um, and so I think for those reasons, my father, you know, really ran the 1968 campaign because of Vietnam, his passion of getting out of Vietnam. So, you know, Vietnam has, has played a significant role. So I, I think it, um, it didn't complicate it so much as is as kind of informed my interest and um, and and feeling that it was such an important subject. Did you have anything else? No, actually, that was the. Do question we have any questions me. from the audience? Questions as opposed to statements. <laughs> we have someone in the back there. Oh, by the way, before we get to the question, I'm told we do have a handful or whatever number of Vietnam veterans here. Is that true? Could you clap if you're from the Vietnam veteran? Do we have some that are here? Raise your hands. There's one I was misinformed. One up at the top, Alex. One up at the top? Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, we have a question here in the back, on the, near the aisle. Yes, I just wanted to know what happened to most of the refugees after they came off the ships. I know that you went to the Philippines, but did, did, were many brought to the state? How many were brought to the states, or some idea of eventually how they were? You know, where did they, did they eventually end up? Once they got the boats to the Philippines, what happened to the refugees? The uh, refugees of whom, in that three-day period, there were about 130,000 who came under our protection, uh, were moved through the Philippines to Guam, thence from Guam to Camp Pendleton, California, Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, and Indian Town Gap Military Reservation in Pennsylvania. And from there, they were sponsored out. They either were linked up with relatives or churches and other civic groups uh, took responsibility for them. And then, of course, during that first few years, and actually the first decade or 15 years, another 1.8 million or so uh, came out, the boat people, at terrible risk and cost. And most of them most of them wound up in the United States as well. As to where they are today and what they've done, I would commend you to uh, go to any town that has a large Vietnamese community. Uh, Orange County, California has a whole section called Little Saigon where you will see an amazingly, amazingly prosperous and uh, integrated, um, what's the word, when people melt into the the, the so-called melting pot. The Vietnamese have preserved their culture, pride themselves at having gotten off welfare sooner than anybody in the history of the country. And uh, they are lawyers, doctors, engineers, realtors, uh, and community leaders and government officials and members of the US military all over our country. And uh, they are, you know, their record that they have written uh, from the day that they came starting in 75, with not, most of them with nothing, um, always makes me very proud. What, what, what happened to you? Where did you go when this was over? You, 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 you helicopter out of there. Uh, I, and take us through the stages of where you go and where you end up. Uh, I went to teach Army ROTC at the University of South Florida in Tampa, Florida for four years. Uh, thence for uh, six years in Germany uh, as an intelligence officer, counterintelligence, spy catching. Thence to um, the invasion of Panama, uh, Operation Desert Storm, retired as a colonel in military intelligence in 98 after 30 years, then was called back uh, for trips to Guantanamo to adv advise on how they were doing in the Guantanamo interrogation project. Gave them a bad report card, which they ignored. Uh, then I went to Baghdad uh, a year later to take a look at detention and uh, handling detainees, and I gave them a bad report card, which they ignored. Uh, and since then, uh, for a decade, I worked as a director of global security and investigations for the Callaway Golf Company, protecting the company's secrets, the intellectual property, uh, 
which is sort of what you do when you're a counterintelligence <laughs> officer. And uh, retired after 10 years doing that, and now I take care of my gardens. I consult occasionally. I'm a spokesperson for, or I'm a spokesperson against inhumane interrogation. I've lobbied on the Hill. I've written op-ed pieces <laughs> because but, but, we lost our way. But, who, but who's more difficult to negotiate with? The North Vietnamese or the PGA, which is a tougher to deal with? Uh, that's a toughie. Okay. That's a toughie. A I'll, I'll let the audience imagine. Who do we have one. down here? Right here. Um, so I thought the ambassador was a really interesting figure. In some ways, there's some reverence paid to the ambassador in the United States. Um, and I wondered if you because of um, the tragedy of his son being lost. And in other ways, some of his actions se seem to border on criminal. Um, so I was curious how you thought about portraying him and also what the, um, the staff around him was sort of feeling this time when he seemed to be ignoring the evacuation. Well. How do you characterize Martin and what he um, did? First of all, I wrote a book about the fall of Saigon eventually, and, uh, and I was somewhat unforgiving and harsh, not unduly so, but I, I really gave him a, not a very good report card, which is common for those who write about it. Uh, as the years go by and I think back on the cards that he was dealt, um, the fact that he was appointed by the president to go to South Vietnam to be the ambassador to that country, and his specific marching orders were that you are not going over there to be the last U.S. ambassador to Vietnam. Um, he did, as, was, as, as it occurred to him, the best road, what he did, thinking at the time that it was the right thing to do, but he was dealt a terrible hand of cards. The Congress didn't agree at all with the executive on this. So you had an executive branch saying you are not going to be the last ambassador to Vietnam. You had a president in the form of Nixon who was prepared to re-intervene in Vietnam, even though we can all argue that it was unrealistic. And of course it couldn't happen because of Watergate. But Martin wound up the classic you know, guy stuck uh, with this terrible baggage from his own family side and his intention to do the right thing so that Vietnam would not fall to the communists at the point of an AK-47. So I'm a little more forgiving of him and I think that Rory has done a real favor because in this film, I think you get the message that there are some things about Ambassador Mars. Not all, you know, shame on him. You know, he was out to lunch. He wasn't on board. I think there's a case that can be made that this was a very deeply conflicted man who really all along was trying to do the right thing, uh, facing a hostile Congress that wasn't about to fund his effort, facing the fact that the executive who appointed him to the job is no longer there that the American people have turned against the war, and there he was, holding the bag. So I'm, I'm, I try hard to be fair to Ambassador Martin. We've got time for a couple more. Do we have anybody, uh, where else are we? Somewhere over here? Right in the back there, yes. What, what happened to Martin? He came back, he testified before the Congress. Um, he was recognized on the one hand for the, you know, the conflicting situation he was in. He was quite bitter about the fact that he was castigated by a lot of people in the press and the media. Um, and he collected a lot of documents that he wanted to write and tell his story about it. And uh, retired to North Carolina, by the way. That was his last ambassadorial post and um, stopped by a North Carolina highway patrolman in, when he was in his late 70s. Uh, a bunch of documents in the trunk of his car proved to be the documents that he wanted to write his side of the story, but they were documents that had not been cleared for release and they were seized, and so he never got to write his book. And he passed away, I, I'm, I'm not so sure I can say that, sometime in the early 80s, but I could be wrong. A very tragic figure. We have time for one more. Uh, down here. We'll do these two. Go right, go right ahead, yeah. Are you familiar with any Vietnamese that travel back, or in this country, who travel back to visit 
Okay, here we go. Okay, go right ahead then. Uh, do you know of, of Vietnamese who uh, have chosen to go back and visit the country, probably not relocate there, uh, particularly in the last couple of decades when things have become much more comfortable? Uh, yes. Um, from 75 until about 85 or 90, the, the Vietnamese communists were extremely vindictive. Uh, they had promised there'd be no bloodbath, there'd be no retributions. They told us uh, to our faces in Saigon as the country was unraveling that we need all the Vietnamese to rebuild the country. This is a, going to be national reconciliation. And then, of course, they did what they did, which was to establish a huge network of re, re, so-called re-education camps and uh, show a very strong vindictive side. They also learned the hard way that it's a lot easier to win a war than it is to run a country. And they had a mess of an economy and a mess of cleaning up from the war. And people were dropped dead miserable in Vietnam uh, for years and years and years after the country fell, which is what begot the boat people. Somewhere around 1990, early 90s or thereabouts, um, the Vietnamese communists who always tend to look to China uh, for examples, and China had had the Tiananmen Square thing, and then the Chinese had determined that the best way to have peace in the country and develop the country was to allow the citizenry to get rich, to own property, to become capitalistic, as long as they keep their lips zipped about politics. And so the Vietnamese adopted that sometimes jokingly called market Leninism, which is the party is the party, this is an authoritarian state, you don't elect us, we serve, and we take care of the good of the people, in exchange for which, as long as you keep your political lips zipped, you can go out and form joint corporations with American companies, we'll let you travel, we'll let people travel here. And Vietnam did, much as China, uh, begin to turn around. Thousands and thousands of Vietnamese, including Vietnamese who fled uh, at great personal risk, have gone back to Vietnam. Some of them are the children of, you know, they came over here, these are the kids you see getting on the helicopters. They're over there, they uh, own part, you know, joint venture companies. Um, they want to help rebuild their country. Uh, and it is quite impressive to see the number of Viet Q, that's what they call themselves, overseas Vietnamese, who've gone back. Other Vietnamese, principally older Vietnamese, are not so forgiving and not so anxious and not so willing to go back, and they hold great rancor and bitterness out for the communists. So not surprisingly, their community is just as split on the subject as our community, as our country can be as well, when we consider I would, it. I would just add that we've done a number of screenings with the Vietnamese communities of this film, and I, I would, in my, um, impression is that the older generation who really live this um, has a lot of reservation about going back to Vietnam and a lot of fear actually of going back to Vietnam. The younger generations, their children are, are more, yeah, they're very happily going back and forth and, and, and more, um, I think, feel very comfortable going back to the country. And I'd like to just add one other thing, which is, you know, the story of the Vietnamese coming to this country is an extraordinary story and is deserving of its own documentary. And to that end, along with the effort of this film, through our website, we are gathering the stories of the Vietnamese who came to this country. And we're working with a group called StoryCorps to gather those stories. And they'll be all on our website. One last one here. because they might be concerned about becoming a political movie uh, because, of the, because of your family? Um, I think that there were certainly some reservations, this being one of them initially, um, but he came around. Um, Kissinger was very hard to convince. He was, he was one of the harder ones to convince. Um, our hope initially was to go to Vietnam and interview Vietnamese who had been left behind and were still in, in um, country, but there was a consensus and everybody we spoke to that there was no way anybody in the country would be willing to talk to us on camera. Um, so that was an area of resistance. You know, 
I was pretty clear that we weren't really, I didn't want to make a film about the policies and about the politics. I really wanted it to be about the people on the front lines. You know, I didn't want to have a narrator on the film. We don't use any experts. We don't use any voices of people who weren't there. It's all people who lived these moments. And, you know, I wanted to document that. So I was pretty clear about that vision. And, and I think that was pretty convincing for the people that we wanted to interview. And ultimately, everybody who we approached said yes. So, um, so I, I feel like we got you know, the, the range of voices that I wanted to get in the film. Um, I'd like to add a point since <laughs> she pointed the finger at me. Uh, when I was contacted, I had reservations, and they were principally that having already done some documentaries on this subject, although nothing to compare with this effort, I learned. Well done, uh, Stuart. Yeah. Uh, I was worried about whether it would be political and... Uh, she sent her co-producer down, Kevin McAllister, to spend a few hours with me, not on camera, just for us to get to know one another. And he impressed me so positively, and it was so obvious to me that they were going to do, do it right. I didn't quite understand how they were going to do it, but I had a good feeling about it. But make no mistake about it, the, what happened in that screen on that night was the saddest day of my life. And uh, it's not the kind of thing that you want to prolong, it just, it happened, and it was extremely, extremely sad. Um, but Rory Kennedy managed to make a film about these sad, terrible days that were such a negative reflection in so many ways about our country and its performance and our system. She managed to make a movie of that period that is, in some ways, uplifting. And for that, I have always given her the credit she deserves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to ask you, you. Uh, la our last question, and that is just really quickly, and this is, this is a question that might not have a quick answer, but see if you can give us one, and that is, this was your life as a military officer, and you were there, you weren't there to evacuate people, you were there to win a war initially, correct? You were, there, you were there to fight a war and win a war. And when you look back on it now, 40 years later, do you think that if we had won that war in terms of an independent, self-determining South Vietnam, that would have made much of a difference? Well, that's the great what if, of course. And the what if, I can argue it either way for four hours and we don't have more than three minutes. Um, but I, I must say that, in my opinion, even if we would have gotten money from the Congress, and even if we would have done things differently, we were so far over our heads in that environment, in that historical, cultural, linguistic environment. We were so far over our heads, however noble our intent was, and it certainly was that. I always agreed when President Reagan said that the Vietnam War was a noble endeavor. However, it didn't work out. Uh, we were just over our heads, and that is, um, you know, the lesson on the limits of national power, I take that very seriously. And so I know that a lot of you are sitting in here right now thinking about what I think about every day when I watch the events that are underway in the Middle East. You can't help but wonder, you know, did we learn anything? And, uh, and I sometimes say to myself with great sadness that our lessons learned approach in the United States military is really a misnomer, and we probably should call it lessons observed and then forgotten, because that's what we do. Thank you all for coming. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you to Rory Kennedy, and thank you to Stuart Harrington. Thank you all for coming.